Hey everyone and welcome to the Nerd Room where we talk all things comics and movies. This is episode number 51. We're discussing trailers for Transformers The Last Night, The Mummy Reboot, and Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. I'm Renee Ostim. I'm Troy. And uh, back again for the third time, I yeah. think. Third yeah, time it is. Yeah. I'm Wayne and glad to be here again. Yeah, welcome back, buddy. Glad to have you back in the nerd room. New audio equipment this week. I know we discussed a couple of weeks ago that we we're going to try to debut this on our 52nd episode, the year anniversary episode. Came in the mail this week. I got too excited, just plugged it all in, and yeah. here we go. <laughs> yeah, it looks great. Sounds great. So uh, hopefully y'all are uh, enjoying the experience, the new experience. Yeah, yeah, I'm hoping it works because I literally cut open the boxes and plugged everything. I've never <laughs> used a mixer before, <laughs> brand new mics. I'm hoping that it comes out clean here, and I apologize if it doesn't come out as crisp as maybe we want. We've got to do some fiddling here yeah. with, the, with the mixer and that, and i got to figure out one of these hundred knobs of what to turn to make sound <laughs> yeah. good. But nonetheless, I think it should be all right. Yeah. It's been a, a relatively busy week compared to the last couple of weeks mm-hmm. in the nerd world. We've got three huge trailers dropping. Yeah, I know it's going to be some great stuff, man. I, I love talking Transformers <laughs> always and uh, a big fan of the Mummy franchise. So can't wait to see what happens in this episode. we got lots of news to get into first here. Jumping straight into the MCU, Thor 3, Thor Ragnarok. We've got a first promo art from this. At first... I thought this was a fan-made kind of clip art type thing. Yeah. But apparently, this is real. Yeah, it's legit. You know, it kind of looks a little bit like a like video game. It's actually Marvel versus Capcom, kind of yeah. like with the yeah. with the, the neon kind of colors. Yes, but Thor has the helmet. He does, right? and he, he's he has the helmet, and Hulk has the gladiatorial gear on him. Yeah, it, it looks like it's come straight out of the comic book. It yeah. really does. And I'm blown away by even the color scheme here because this is a movie, and we talked about this before when. Uh, the director kind of did that little walk through the Facebook Live event through the set, through this kind of galactic junkyard. Yes. And we commented on the tone and the color palettes that they were using in this because we thought this was going to be very much an apocalyptic movie. And it didn't really come off that way. And this poster here doesn't make it seem like it's going to be that either. Yeah, again, you know, from everything we've seen with this movie, they're really separating themselves from uh, the Dark World and the first Thor. This is like a big uh, step in a different direction. Yeah. So I'm happy to see something different here. And I, I think I mentioned this before. I have no idea what this movie is actually about because there's so many elements building here onto what is already a quite a complex Thor Asgardian type world, right? right? So now we're layering in the Hulk and for whatever reason in space, Doctor Strange, Hela, all these other characters. Beta Ray Bill, hopefully. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so it's going to be interesting to see how well this universe kind of coalesces into a single standalone film because we're expanding a lot here again, I think. I think they're trying to bring in Elden's of the Guardians of the Galaxy, which this really does look like from the promo art. It's got that feel to it, that 80s vibe, right? Do you think we're going to get a massive Planet Hulk storyline here, or is this going to be a brief side tangent, a 20-minute side tangent in the movie to bring Hulk out, or we're going to have a much larger arc here where it does involve Hulk appearing and reappearing numerous times throughout the movie? I don't think so. I think we're going to get some cool fan servers. You know, I think we're going to get some cool scenes from like yeah. Planet Hulk and like that that awesome animated movie. Mm-hmm. But what Marvel's done such a great job of is giving you little nods to things that have come up in the comics. You know, yeah. Tony Tony Stark's little alcohol uh, demon in the bottle yeah. arc, right? They've always just touched little bits of these uh, little lines. So I don't see them going too much into it. But at the same time, though, the audience has been asking for a Planet Hulk movie, right? Yeah, and we're never going to get us. a standalone Planet Hulk movie. No. Like, this is as best as they can do because Universal still owns the rights to the solo Hulk film yeah. franchise. Yeah. Shoehorning this into a Thor movie or any other type movie, a Guardians movie, you could even do it with. Yeah. This is the only way we're going to get it. And I think they're going down the right path here. It looks fantastic on screen. I'm still having a hard time separating the fact that this isn't some sort of fan art. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It looks kind of cheesy. Like, is this real? And yeah. then you have to like check out the sources like to make sure it actually is official fan art. That's right. Um, going back to your previous point, Troy, about whether this is going to be like a side story for the Hulk. From what I was reading behind the scenes, Mark Ruffalo was only on set for a couple weeks. So yeah. it tells me that possibly he's in it for a small segment in the movie maybe 20 30 minutes at the beginning or in a or like spread out for for the entire movie and then the rest of it's just going to be thor and all of his asgardian issues yeah because uh, again it's you I, I think marvel has learned their lesson or learned from the mistakes of dc when you try to add too many elements in a movie you start to bog it down and if you have one good element you give them a great great little 20 minute thing like they did with spider-man in civil war just enough to keep the fans wanting more. Mm-hmm. No more. Yeah. And then 
That way, whenever you see Hulk, you're excited. You're not, oh, not again. Exactly. Yeah. But the one different thing about here, when you contrast it to Spider Man or Black Panther, mm. is that they're establishing these characters. Hulk's an established character. Yeah. But you're also transporting into something completely different. You have to explain almost an origin story for Hulk of why he's not on Earth, yeah. why he's in space, and why yeah. he's in this gladiatorial arena. So that's a lot to get through and to, to bridge that understanding, mm. I think, at least for the common fan. Like, we get this, right? We understand that in the comics, the Illuminati shot Hulk off in a space. Yeah, exactly. Which would have been a great way to end Civil War. By the way, awesome. yeah, awesome. yeah, <laughs> that would have been nice. But you know, this—that's not what happens. So there's a lot of explaining to do. I don't know if they're just going to make this leap in logic and just say the Hulk is here. He he was picked up by whomever. That's an easy way to get out of this. Like a Yondu type character, or someone comes and just beams Hulk up, and they take him, and then all of a sudden he's in the gladiatorial arena. And so I think there's a lot of bridging to do there, and then you add in the element of, of Doctor Strange, and then. Ragnarok even in itself is a massive story. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of layers of complexity to this movie and I'm hoping that they handle this properly because this this could be Thor's, you know, Winter Soldier, right? right. This, yeah. this, the story that actually propels this character into the upper echelons mm-hmm. of the MCU like a Captain America and like an Iron Man. Mm-hmm. And if they do do that, I don't see why these guys aren't coming back. Like Chris Evans appears to be coming back for some sort of at least Captain America cameos here and there throughout mm-hmm. the, the rest of the universe. There was that massive tease by Sebastian Stan with the the Winter Soldier Captain America shield, yeah. which is really cool. That's yeah. Right. So this whole universe seems to be building up that three movies isn't the end of the line. That's right. There's been little rumors of uh, Iron Man 4, yeah. I think, even, right? And yeah. with his appearance in Civil War, Spider-Man Homecoming... Yeah. Like, there's a lot to build on there. But I'm just hoping that they do this universe, at least the Thor-centric universe, justice here to allow him to be on that level with an Iron Man or a Captain America where the next movie coming down the pipe is something that we're excited for. And by the looks of it, they've gone completely different here. Yeah, that's for, for sure. Because, you know, it's the big three. So you got to handle Thor with care. Yeah. Um, Valkyrie is also in this movie as well, yeah. right? Yeah. Do we know if the returning, like crew of Thor is coming like the, 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 I can't remember his Warriors name. 3 yeah, yeah. Are, they, are they in and this Lady movie Lady Sif yeah. yeah I don't I think the Warriors 3 are in this movie but I know the actress that plays Lady Sif has that that show or whatever yeah right and I think Alexander that, I think yeah, or, yeah. And I think that conflicted with the shooting I don't know if she's gonna have some sort of glorified cameo in this where right. she shows up at the start where they're fighting similar to Dark World yes she didn't have a huge part in that either and she yeah. always she was kind of teased as a love interest yeah but I think Valkyrie might be going down that path with the absence of Natalie Portman. Yeah. So hopefully mm-hmm. they kind of just brush that aside. Because <laughs> a lot of characters to handle, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it is. What do you think of him holding two swords instead of uh, Mjolnir here? I show? love that. Yeah. I've always been a, uh, a fan of Thor with this with the sword. You know, there's a there's a there's a cool Marvel Legends. I don't know if you have that one, but I've been chasing it with Thor, and he has the sword. He's kind of in his Marvel now yeah. gear. Yeah, yeah, it's a really good look. So uh, yeah. Swords are awesome. <laughs> yeah, they, they seem to be going down maybe from the rumors that we've heard this unworthy Thor route where he does lose the power to carry Milner yeah. and ends up fighting in this arena, shaved head, all that. That's so right, yeah. There's the unworthy Thor comic that just dropped, which is fantastic. Yeah. High recommend for me. So maybe they're going down that path as well. Kind of separating Thor, putting him more of this like fish out of water type, getting him away from the classic Thor stories and doing something different, I think will really benefit the character, particularly in the MCU. That has my interest. Yeah, I really like that idea. Sticking with the MCU here. Now, Troy, you are a Spider-Man fanboy. Big here, time. Right? We All talked day. about it last week. I believe that there is a trailer for Spider-Man Homecoming coming down the pipe, likely attached to Rogue One. I really thought we were going to get it dropped this weekend. Yeah. But they did show footage at the Brazilian Comic Expo or whatever it is. Right. So, Marvel seemed to have a big presence there. James Gunn was down there and showed the Guardians footage for the first time. Ryan Panagos and a few others of the Marvel kind of digital crew were down there. And they did debut some scenes from Spider-Man Homecoming. Did you have a chance to check them out? Um, I checked out a couple of the tweets and, yeah. you know, a little bit of the description going on there. And uh, I heard it's, you know, short and sweet pretty much what we've gotten, right? Uh, we see, um, I guess we're going to spoil- spoiler. Yeah, spoilers. To, if, you know. if you're not, if you're waiting for the trailer or whatever, we're going to say spoilers for this because we're going to spoil from the scene descriptions that was given by the people that were present there. So mm-hmm. spoilers. Yeah. So John uh, Favreau. Yeah. shows up here right yeah, which is Hogan. yeah right which is awesome um i can't wait to see him and peter parker yeah. interact and all that kind of stuff now he shows up apparently with a suitcase with some sort of upgrade in the suit and yes. we do see something different in the suit but before we comment on that do you think this upgrade could be the iron spider suit 
I hope not. <laughs> you know, what I mean? I've never been a fan of uh, of that costume. I no. think Spider Man has many cool costumes, and that's not one of them. But you know, it's pretty divided because a lot of people really do appreciate that costume. I don't know what it could be. It could be some type of. Um, I can't remember way back when Spider Man defeated the Vulture. He had a little gizmo that he used. Yeah. Because back then he always had these little gizmos to beat. You know, a vacuum for Sandman, rubber gloves <laughs> for Electro. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he did have these little devices to take out his enemies. So I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if it's something to help him defeat Vulture. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's can't wait to see what happens. Yeah. yeah. Now the upgrade could also be what was again shown here mm-hmm. is that we're going Ditko era with this suit, and he's getting. The webs oh, on, under yeah. the, arms. the gliders, yeah, the, yeah. the web gliders, yes, yeah. and the people have been dying for that. Yeah, oh man, I love that. So it's rumored that, or it's actually described in the scene that that uh, he jumps off a building, and he's got the gliders. Cool. And so that's probably and more likely the upgrade that he does get from Happy Hogan, which is from Tony Stark at some point wow. here, to fight a flying vulture here. Yeah. yeah. Now this is Ditko era. This is classic Spider-Man. Yeah. And this is a route that we have not seen in any of the Spider-Man films. No. And I really like that they're doing this here. This, this is going to contrast all of those other suits, something completely different. I think the average fan may roll their eyes at the start. Yeah. But for us comic book fans to understand where this came from, that it was Ditko, and we got the Ditko eyes, the Ditko yeah. looking suit, the, mm-hmm. the small emblem too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think this is a fantastic move on Marvel's part. Bring in a different element of spider man suit to really show how this character, Tom Holland, Peter Parker, is different from everything else that we've seen before. Yeah, but also a throwback to the original yes. character himself, right? This is cool. You know, I've always geeked out when I've seen Spider-Man with a backpack from yeah. Amazing Spider-Man 1. <laughs> and now uh, he has the small eyes that, you know, um, expand up and down. Yeah. Uh, or shrink I should say and then now we also have uh, the wings going on so yeah. I can't really ask for much more what do you what do you think about this I I as soon as I read the whole thing about the the webbing underneath the arms yeah. I'm like I'm on board yeah like I was a little bit like vulture they haven't done them yet and on the big screen yeah I'm just thankful it's not hobgoblin again yeah so or with, demo goblin or whatever you want to call them <laughs> a goblin yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, but no I think his suit is gonna work however they however they make that part of the plot worth he whether he like gets his original suit damaged and then he gets an upgrade or yeah. however they fit into the story i just hope it makes sense yeah. and he actually uses the gliding ability on yeah. the suit to fight vulture but i'm more of a wait and see i've been burned by too many spider-man movies yeah. in the past and i just want it to be good so i'm keeping my expectations a little bit back because i I, I just it, Spider-Man. We got a really good version of him in Civil War, so it's only the only place to go up is up. Hopefully, but, yeah. Hopefully, as long as they don't introduce uh, the the Spidey bike, which they have done in the previous times, even in the recent cartoon, which is a horrible, <laughs> no. horrible thing. Yeah. So as long as it's not the spider bike, should be okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I think they're gonna handle this with with real class here. Like they're they're taking the Ditko stuff. They know what they're doing. They mm-hmm. did that with Civil War here, and I think it's a great way to go. Like I said before, it really contrasts the character to what we've seen before and the fact that he's fighting vulture which appears to have some sort of hover flying abilities in that right. so it'll be a good villain to go up against that it's not like a ground-based villain where he's kind of flying around here and it's just gliders too right? yeah yeah um, so it just kind of gives him that extra little lift as he's going building to building yeah um, so i'm really excited to see that actual footage really yeah. stoked that it's gonna be in front of rogue one yeah. as well like that's oh, gonna be a big man, night it's right be huge <laughs> mm-hmm. so I, I wouldn't be surprised though, actually if it debuts a day or two before that probably uh, just yeah. a build that hype and get people excited going in and seeing this on the big screen on the IMAX for the first time so super excited and I am surprised that they actually let them tweet out because Ryan Panagos he's one of the VPs there at Marvel was actually tweeting this out so Mm -hmm. the scene descriptions usually come from outside sources but this came from directly from Marvel so maybe they're trying to get ahead of it a bit don't know why they didn't just drop the footage yeah but at the same time I think waiting and seeing it on the big screen might be nice. Something different than we're used to with trailers, right? Because yeah. we're used to seeing them on YouTube. To be honest with you, most of the trailers I watch the first time are on my phone. Yeah. Which right. isn't always the best way to watch some of these, right? <laughs> yeah. Particularly with this Transformers one. There's so much going on. Okay. You don't really view the trailer the way it's meant to be viewed, right? So, yeah. You need the big screen. Yeah. I think waiting for this might be might be a good. Nice. Marvel was busy this week because they also dropped a trailer and some gameplay footage from Marvel vs. Capcom 3. Uh, four, four, but I think it's going to be called Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. Infinite. Infinite, okay. Yeah. yeah. This is way outside my wheelhouse. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so much a gamer. I did watch some of the gameplay. Nice. It looks quite intense. Right. 
quick, almost too quick. I'm thinking like, <laughs> how, am I, how would I push the button so fast here? But it seems like a cool story. It's going to be based around the Infinity Stones, I believe. Mm-hmm. And this is picking up, I guess, on previous iterations of this game. So can you just kind of enlighten me a bit here, guys? Yeah, for sure. So I guess this franchise started off way back with um, X-Men Children of the Atom. Yeah, on the Sega, Sega Saturn, on the arcade, and then it moved to Marvel Heroes, which is interesting because Marvel Heroes actually had the gems first introduced. So that's, you know, kind of adapted from the comics uh, Secret Wars, right? Yep. Where you had the Power Stones and all that kind of stuff. So now it's cool to see them go back to um, these gems, uh, probably too late with the movie. Even yep. though looking at the art in these games, it doesn't look anything like the movie. It looks very comic book-like. It does. Yeah. Even the new Captain Marvel that was on there, yeah. very comic book based like present day comic book yeah yeah Mm -hmm. and captain america was like the marvel now costume and iron man's well your typical iron man but you know what's funny i love everything i see except my only problem was the game looks very cartoony it does right a little shiny a little plasticky so that's one of the things i wanted to ask you guys is that i'm not familiar with the previous gameplay or what it looked like but this look like especially ryu from yeah. street fighter or whatever yeah it looked like something out of the sega era yeah right and i don't know if they're doing that on purpose but <laughs> the marvel like the digital representation looked very different than the ryu the street fighter looking character right yeah and so i was kind of confused as to why they were contrasting them so much is that done on purpose maybe like I, yeah most of the time when they do a versus game yeah they want to contrast the different sides okay just, just to give a, a little bit more style um, if you go back to the previous one that was out in 2011, they they had a more slightly hand drawn, cel shaded look for the okay. characters, and then now they're going with a very 3D cartoonish look. A couple things about the game series, which is for people who played the game series, is that there have been X Men characters a part of this game series since the very beginning, like mm-hmm. Storm, Magneto, Sentinel, Juggernaut. Yep. Um, Doctor Doom as well. They've been staples in the game series. And now with Marvel and Fox and having their goal back and forth about their properties, a lot of rumors that it's not going to have any X-Men characters whatsoever. People's favorites won't be in the game series. And it's more likely going to have the Marvel Netflix heroes, Luke Cage, Jessica yeah, Jones. Yeah. And then they've, they've also had, in the most recent one that came out, in 2011, they had Doctor Strange in it. They had Dormammu. They had Iron Fist. Yep. They had Rocket Raccoon as characters. So it's more like those are going to make a return. And we're going to get more of our Guardians of the Galaxy. I think so. A push for them, right? And and definitely a push for the humans, I would say. Yeah. Because yeah. Marvel's been really pushing these characters. Yeah, you see a Black Bolt, maybe Medusa. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah. And I yeah, think exactly. Medusa would play really well in a game like this. Yeah. Um, I'm excited for you because I'm going to try and get you into these games. You got me into the, the Marvel Legends. So it's only right that I get you into these video I'm, games. I'm fair. <laughs> Star Lord, I'd like to see Star Lord pop up. Yeah. But, and you were mentioning Groot. I think, I think Groot would be really Groot's cool in a video game. For sure, going to be in the game. Yeah, yeah I think so. Like, I, I'm totally down for nice. an evening of playing a little bit of Marvel vs. Capcom. Like, uh, I've, I've never really played these style of games since maybe like a Mortal Kombat or yeah. Street Fighter Two. Nice. And so it's been a long time since I mashed buttons. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm totally down for trying this out. And the fact that they have characters in there that I'm familiar with and that I like, and mm-hmm. I, you know, like I said, the gameplay like, does look pretty intense, pretty quick. It almost looks like can you play four players on it it's four characters on the screen but it's only yeah. two players so it's kind of like a, a team okay so you pick your team uh ryu and spider-man and you go up against captain marvel and iron man yeah. if you will whereas the last two have last been three the last three have been uh three on three battles yeah right? so, so that's a little little step backwards yeah, yeah definitely and then to touch on the whole infinity stones from what i've been reading there was an interview that i watched and the guys from Capcom and Marvel were talking about what they wanted to do. And like they were talking about bringing in new characters and having the Infinity Stones as a prominent feature in this game makes it kind of coincide with what the, what the movies are doing right yeah. now. So it's kind of it makes sense what they're doing. And I'm, I'm betting this is probably a push more from Marvel than from Capcom. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So like I definitely see like more of the more of the relevance with the like you were saying before with the Captain Marvel suit directly taken from the comic books yeah. present day and again i i'm excited yeah nice. really excited because people have been wanting this for a while yeah. is this like, like a gameplay type thing where you could play single player and you go through a series of battles and that and you yes. eventually get to like a boss like thanos or something so yeah. there's yeah. kind of a story built into this and weaved into it. it's not just yeah. like a you know a versus type fighting game yeah, yeah i'm sure they'll have options where you can just play the computer yeah, for yeah. fun but they'll definitely have a story mode um i believe the last one marvel vs. capcom 3 and marvel vs. capcom 3 ultimate edition you fought galactus yeah okay. at the end which was which was pretty cool yeah. um 
So it'll definitely be a big bad. It, it might even be Thanos, right? Probably. Yeah, well, with the Infinity Stones and all that. It seems right? like Has Thanos be. being the big bad coming down the pipe for Infinity War. It seems like you said, Wayne, if they're if Marvel's really pushing on the end of this, they're going to be pushing their characters they want out there. That's why Captain Marvel was in the trailer. That's why Iron Man, Cap yeah. were in these trailers, right? And you get that familiarity with some of the Street Fighter characters yes. as well. But it's really a Marvel centric trailer. Like they're For showing sure. their big three right now, and especially Captain Marvel, they're pushing her in the comic books, they're pushing her in the movies, mm-hmm. and you know why not have her front and center here too? Right. What better platform? Yeah. Jumping quickly over to the DC Cinematic Universe, and again, this is seemingly our bi-weekly or weekly. You know what shenanigans is DC and Warner Brothers up to in their cinematic universe? That's how I like to call it. How I've dubbed it here. <laughs> Aquaman has been pushed back to October 5th from a late July, I think July 28-ish, 2018 slot. And it was pushed back to not oppose, I believe, one of the Mission Impossibles that are dropping down here on Mission Impossible 5, 6, whatever it is. There's also these rumors, and this is not the first time this has happened with DC. We saw Batman vs. Superman get pushed up to avoid Civil War. Yep. Wonder Woman get pushed up to avoid Transformers the last night. And also Flash is in somewhat disarray as it's lost multiple directors. And there's no real firm date for this. Do you think Aquaman is in trouble or are they just trying to get it into it, an area? We, we, see, we saw this with this year. September, October, kind of a dead zone, right? November starts to pick up and then you get into your December, Christmas time, Star Wars month movies right right so do you think they're moving aquaman purely to pick up on a kind of the the dead zone in october the pre-halloween type crowd or do you think they're having issues with this movie now moving from july to october is not that big of a move yeah. but it's still quite a distance right i think they're okay i think they're just moving it towards october just to kind of clean up uh i think is it james wong yeah that's the director yeah he's been on here for a while and he you know he handles his properties pretty well but again it's more than just the director it's obviously the studios jumping in yeah. here but i think october would be a safer route to put this character yeah. in right yeah yeah because you get his introduction in batman vs Superman. we're going to see him in justice league and i do not believe they actually even started filming this and we're 2018 we're still a like two years out of right yeah almost and so i don't imagine this has anything to do with the script or anything like mm-hmm. that because you know they bang out these scripts sometimes in six months or whatever and the fact that they do have a prominent actor taking that role we've seen him before hopefully as a good showing in justice league i agree this is just fully down to positioning a movie for success as opposed to trying to take on a tom cruise movie yeah. or whatever right exactly. something that can even chew a bit into these movies I think would be detrimental to the character. They need to have kind of their own week or two, like we saw with Doctor Strange in November. He had yeah. a couple of weeks there to shine, and look what the character's done, right? Huge. I think Doctor Strange is now over six hundred million. Yeah, it's over Iron Man two globally. Yeah, as far wow. as his total haul. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, you have to remember too with Iron Man and Iron Man two in the early MCU movies the international halls weren't near what they are. The international halls are almost double now the domestic with China and with big markets in Germany, Japan and that. Mm -hmm. So those movies weren't as prominently featured in those foreign markets. So you do look at the contrast between Avengers and Iron Man 3, compare that to what we're seeing for Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange is still doing very well. Mm -hmm. But when you actually insert those big characters into those markets, you do see the massive uptick. And that's why I think Doctor Strange is over the global hall for Iron Man 2. Not to say that the character is less popular or the yeah. movie isn't good. I just don't think the MCU was as established internationally as it is right now. Yeah, exactly. Definitely agree. So just to touch, what, touch on what you guys are saying about Aquaman, um, I, have a, I have an alternate theory, so it may not be popular. But <laughs> we love speculation and theory here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I think the delay for Aquaman, because I want to say beginning of this year, la- end of last year, I was hearing that Aquaman would be kind of a scarier tale, like a scarier movie. I heard rumors about that. I don't know how true they are, obviously. But James Wan's a horror director. Yeah, he did Saw. Yeah. So and The Conjuring too? Yeah, The yeah, Conjuring. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense because he did the Saw movies and they're not for kids, by the way. No. So, um, <laughs> they're not so, for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but so when they were saying that it's going to be more of a scary type movie, okay, cool, because it's the ocean, there's scary monsters down there. It makes sense to a degree, but... Remember, this is DC, and this is before Batman vs. Superman and Suicide Squad got released on the criticisms that they dealt with. And then I recently, I want to say summer, I heard that they were gonna, it's going to be more of a swashbuckling adventure, quote unquote. So which version are we, are we going to mixture of the two? Were they always the same, which is people's different interpretations? And I think that if you're going from purely from the creative reasoning 
for the delay or pushback or date change is taking up the Flash's old spot since they've recently lost a director. I think Jeff Johns creatively may have something to do with this. Maybe he wants to tighten up the script a bit more. Mm -hmm. Because look how long we had to wait for Doctor Strange. Look how long we had to wait for Ant-Man and all these movies that Kevin Feige had his hands in. They lost a director for Ant-Man partway through. Like they were almost ready to shoot and they lost a director. And that's creative differences, whatever you want to call it. And that tells, that says to me that Kevin Feige was like, no, he's not the right guy for the job. And we get the new guy, I don't remember his name, but look how pretty good... Yeah, look how good Ant Man turned out. Yeah, so I think this I think this is a result of Jeff Johns being in a controlling position where he's like, no, this is not good enough. You guys have to work this story better. Maybe there's more hooks that they want to put in. Maybe he wants the more long term planning for the DC universe because there hasn't really been any before this. Mm -hmm. There's Man of Steel, Batman vs Superman, Suicide Squad. Like going forward, if they ever want to compete with Marvel, it's going to have to be you know, a little bit further planning. And I think that this is probably, if it's going to be creatively, it's going to be Jeff Johns having his influence on doing his job. Because yeah. Justice League, I think, is finished shooting already. Yeah. 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 So there's nothing he can really do because they've already shot the scenes. Yeah. And yeah. Wonder Woman is on the tail end of finishing, I believe. No, it's already cut. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. there you go. That's so great. Yeah. So yeah. Aquaman being the only movie that's currently in the pipeline, for other than the Ben Affleck Batman movie, but... Pretty much Ben Affleck's a really good art, like writer director, yeah. so there's no worry about that. But it's just James Wan's untested with properties, like properties of this level where he doesn't have as much creative control as he used to because Saw was kind of his baby in the yeah. beginning. Yeah. And so I think that's maybe Jeff Johns has a little bit more into this than than we know about, on top of not wanting to compete up against other bigger movies. Yeah. And, during the year. Yeah, I think it's probably a mixture of both. There. You're yeah. probably yeah. seeing some elements of... I, you know, I really see... they got to avoid the Thor kind of trap here where yeah. they make it look like Thor. you got the big dude. you got the long similar hair. Like, fish out of water <laughs> right? type character, yeah. right? Oh, he's got punted out of Atlantis. Now he's got to wander around on Earth. Finds a girl, whatever saves the day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think it's, it's kind of elements of both. And the fact that we're going to have a character somewhat develops coming out of Justice League, you may need to tweak the script a bit here too. Yeah. But one other point, actually, you brought up Batman, Ben Affleck's Batman. One of the other rumors were that it was moving so that Batman can take that slot, that July slot, that kind of, you know, typical summer blockbuster type movie. I don't know if Batman really needs to be put in any sort of blockbuster no. type frame. But at the same time, there's thoughts that that could actually be slotted into 2018 because there are rumors that that is going to start shooting sometime soon, that they've tightened up the script a bit more and that they're looking to bring that movie out in sometime in 2018. Well, do we do we have like even a somewhat soft release date on the first Marvel's Infinity War movie? Cause yes, it's, it's May 2018. Okay, so that's far enough away for Batman. Oh yeah, Definitely. yeah. So yeah, May is, or 2018 is going to be a big year. So yeah, May 5th or 6th or whatever it turns out to be. I think it's May 5th, 2018 is when Infinity War drops. So yeah, it has enough separations. Nothing's going to want to get anywhere near that. Yeah, but July is often a bogged down type of month for film releases. And do you really want to stick your Batman in kind of this time frame? We're going to have maybe a week or two solid weeks before it kind of gets at least encroached by some other major action flick, or you could just put it in a March or October, or November time frame where it can have a month to kind of just run around like Batman vs Superman. Did. Exactly. Yeah. That makes a lot more sense. And we've had a lot of movies, 2018, 2017 are really exciting years. And we had 2017 coming up on us here and we were getting the trailers dropping for our early releases in the year for our May through June releases. And this week in particular, we've been kind of jumping around here, hoping to see a trailer at some point point. And we got three this week. <laughs> we got the Mummy reboot with Tom Cruise coming off of the end of, I think, their early 2000s movies with, yeah. uh, I can't even remember his name. Brendan Fraser. Brendan Fraser, yeah. thank you. Uh, I really like those movies. Yep. And I think they had kind of a, a really nice vibe feel to them. And that kind of fit my age at the time. Yeah. Uh, we've got Transformers, The Last Night, another entry from Michael Bay into this universe, coming off the back end of their soft-ish reboot with kind of revamping the cast. You're adding mm-hmm. Mark Wahlberg, but still having our, our similar you know, Optimus Prime and Bumblebee and all these type characters. And then we also get Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, the first official trailer, the first trailer yeah. I'm saying in air quotes here was a teaser of sorts not yeah. really much revealed there this trailer in itself shows a lot more of the characters but still really no story no 
So what we're going to do here is we're going to kind of do a high level discussion of Transformers and the Mummy. And then we're going to do a little bit similar to what we've done in the past is kind of break down Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 in a bit more detail because that's what we do here. We talk about comic book movies. The other two, yes, they are exciting movies to a degree, but we're going to break them down in a little bit less detail. All right, so let's kick off the discussion here of our new 2017 trailers with the Mummy reboot, or what I'm assuming is a reboot. This looks like it's taking place in present day. We have Tom Cruise filling the lead male role here, and we have an all-new resurrected mummy in the form of a female-type queen or princess right, That's right here. And the trailer, so we did watch two different trailers here. We watched the, the official trailer, and then there was a two-minute behind-the-scene type vignette that we watched as well at Wayne's recommendation here. So the, let's start with the trailer itself. It kind of opened to more or less what appears to be a scene directly out of the film, kind of like the opening sequence almost here, right? Yeah. And it kind of builds here into an eventual plane crash of, of some sort, right? Mm -hmm. Kicking off a trailer like this, like I wasn't completely sold at the start of this trailer. I yeah. felt like other than the fact that it seems like a cool plane crash sequence and you do get this sarcophagus kind of sitting off in the corner there, it seemed a bit weird to me this is how you're starting off the trailer. Other than the fact that Tom Cruise did his own stunt and was actually in a plane crash for this. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys think of how this trailer started? I, I love it. You know, this I've never been like the biggest mummy person. Yeah. I, I like the first one and two. But, man, I got to tell you, I like the direction they're going with this, especially, I believe this is Universal's um, kickoff for their, their expanded universe, what they're doing with uh, uh, the werewolf, um, or the wolfman, the mummy, and Dr. Jackal, Mr. Hyde, I think even Van Helsing, they're doing one big, huge universe. Yeah. So to see them jump off with this trailer looked pretty cool. I like that they're going with the princess route or queen yep. as the mummy. Um, the plane ride kind of reminded me a little bit of the Dark Knight Rises. Yeah. A little bit of that feel going on. And, and I think Tom Cruise is just great. This guy is like a classic action star, right? What he does here. So I can't wait to see, man. This, this trailer sold me. Yeah, yeah, we've got all the classic Tom Cruise trailer sequences. Him running away from something, yeah. doing some crazy stunts, kind of yelling, screaming a bit here. Yeah. And looking at the, the behind-the-scenes vignette, it looks like a lot of these are practical effects. Yeah. It looks like the plane was that zero-G plane that goes up and down. It looks like he is doing a lot of the stunts, a lot of the scenes with at least some of the explosion and then the, the running action sequences here. So that's one thing that you can commend Tom Cruise for is that he is the one doing these stunts. And I think that makes a difference in the movie here. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I'm getting a real kind of Mission Impossible type vibe from yeah. this, which is hard to disconnect Tom Cruise from that series now that he's so ingrained with that type mm -hmm. of action. Yeah. Yeah. And I think they're bringing elements of that series into this. But I'm interested in here, Troy, what you said about them building this monster universe. And, you know, when we were watching the trailer, I said to myself, you know, the Russell Crowe character who begins to narrate a part of this trailer looks like some sort of curator. But you mentioned that he might be Dr. Jekyll or Mr. Hyde or whatever. Yes, like correct. Be. Yeah. So I think that's a cool addition to this. And I really like Russell Crowe. And it looks like from the vignette that they do have some sort of fight sequence. And yeah, I, I really like his presence in this in this trailer here. I think that's, for me, what really starts to capture me when you bring Russell Crowe into this and you start developing a bit more of the action sequences that we're seeing. Like I said, I'm not always a fan of just slotting in a scene of a movie into the start of, of a trailer. I understand yeah. kind of why they do that, trying to build a bit of the vibe here. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I, I'm not always a huge fan of that. Yeah, definitely. I like the trailer. I think it's, you know, a good 7 out of 10 trailer. Uh, the behind-the-scenes look actually did it. For me, as far as wanting me to like making sure I actually go get tickets for the movie, like opening night, it's just a lot of the action, the practical effects, like you were saying, them on the zero G plane, shooting all those scenes. I'm like, yes, practical effects. Where do I sign up? I want more of it because every single movie now has just has CG everywhere. Every single shot is CG, and you can see in the behind the scenes look, it's just practical effects, things breaking, things exploding. I'm I don't know if I'm solo on the reboot though. It being a reboot because correct me if I'm wrong but the original Mummy series was set in like the 30s and 40s yeah, 20s 30s 40s I think exactly yeah. so this could be the same universe just you know 70 years later yeah that yeah. universe kind of went sideways though towards the end couple like that yeah. that was one of the ones that fell plague to this idea that you had to have CG everything because I think they had like 
like uh, abomination or they had, whatever. They had the rock with the unfinished. CG, yeah, so there's the scorpion a scorpion king, king yeah. and then yeah. I think the fourth one or something they had some sort of yetis or something. Yeah, uh, yeah. Got, there was even a spinoff I think with the scorpion king. Yeah, yeah there yeah. was. Yeah. yeah. So that launched the rock's career, which I'm happy for that. Yeah. But I'm not so much on board. I'm happy that they're kind of doing this yeah. in a reboot style. They're kind of you know changing and flipping the script here a bit because that one felt kind of cartoony. I like the first two. I think yeah. what they did there in the early 2000s yeah. or whenever it was was good for the time and then they got kind of caught up in themselves trying to just pump out these movies exactly. to get the box office so it looks like you know I, and Universal has tried a couple times to get this universe off the ground with a couple different characters that Dracula movie that yeah Dracula out. Untold yeah. or something mm-hmm. so hopefully yeah. this is the start to their Avengers X this cinematic monster universe right. and having Tom Cruise at the helm. I'm not always a big fan of Tom Cruise. My dad is also a big hater of Tom Cruise. Oh, really? <laughs> and maybe that's some of that's kind of instilled in me, but I, I like what he's doing in the Mission Impossible and I like what they're doing here with the, like I said, with the practical. It looks cool. Yeah. And I, I just have to see a bit more of what they're going to do with the villain here. Like I think everything... I don't know. It's hard to say. Like, I like, yeah. like you said, that they're going down the path with the princess and queen, mm-hmm. but I'm still not completely sold on that whole aspect of it. But I do like Tom Cruise and what I'm seeing here yeah. as far as the effects go. Yeah. It's interesting because I almost thought for a second they were going to go back more to the classic mummy route, like the old black and whites, yeah. you know, but it looks like it's definitely like toilet be... paper wrap. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It'd be a little too campy for us. I know we'd be able to take it seriously. But no. no. Uh, but I think, you know, to reiterate on your point, Tim is like, it is kind of a Mission Impossible looking movie. It, like I got that vibe from it, especially with starting out in a plane. Like the last one, yeah. he was hanging out the side of a plane when as it, as it was taking off. So I don't know how well that's going to go with the rest of the movie. But Tom Cruise, when you put him in action, he carries. He carries. I think he delivers. I don't think he's. I've ever seen a movie that he's phoned in. I mean, I can see a couple times like Jennifer Lawrence. She's yes. phoned in a couple movies. Tom Cruise has been doing this for a long, long time, and he gives every movie a hundred percent, whether the movie might not be good or not. That's true. I feel like he gives it his all every time, at least. So yeah, I agree. I am also very excited for this. Like, I'm not, I'm not like on the edge of my seat excited, yeah. but this is something that I would consider to go see just based purely off this trailer. And this drops June 9th, 2017. So this is coming out at the start of the summer movie blockbuster season, but a month after Guardians of the Galaxy. So I. I'm going to put this on the list right now nice. of an anticipated film just based off this trailer for 2017. Good stuff. So the next movie on the dock, and this comes out not too long after The Mummy. This drops on June 23rd is Transformers The Last Night. So this trailer kicks off with a very eerie remix of a Flaming lip song called Do You Realize? And I like the touch of this music. But then we get into the actual footage. And this seems like a a post-apocalyptic type film. I do not remember what happened at the end of Age of Extinction or whatever it was. But I do not remember the whole world coming to an end here. And this is the vibe that you get through this whole entire trailer. Like the whole world is ending. And we do see scenes from some of the rumored locations that we heard. That were with you know Nazi flags and you know being King called Arthur. the yeah the Knights Templar type feel to it here yeah. and we discussed I think when they first released those is this some sort of time travel movie but with the narration of Odin or sorry Anthony Hopkins <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that's all I could think of the Odin's whole time son. was that Odin was narrating because yeah. you see him over you know narrate over some of the Infinity War stuff and Thor stuff too yeah and that's all I could think about in this in this trailer was Thor was narrating a Transformers or Thor. Odin was narrating <laughs> a Transformers trailer here. But I don't even remember what's going with this because I, I've completely lost my train of thought because this just seems like a whole jumbled full of, of different <laughs> scenes yes. from the movie. Great. But what do you what are your take on this idea that we have this really post apocalyptic feel? They they seem to be trying to reinsert the whole Cybertron war with Earth that it's been going on for a long time. And I never really got that feel from the other movies. They just seem to be somewhat ignoring the continuity that they've built, but also still building off of what they had there. So I'm just immensely confused as to what they're trying to do in this film going forward from this trailer. Like it really seems like they're inserting the, you know, Optimus and all these characters or even whatever, Megatron or whatever, Decepticons, into past human events and that they've had some sort of effect on them all the way back to King Arthur, right? Yeah. What, yeah. <laughs> what are your thoughts on this trailer? Like, I know I just kind of ran through a bit of it there, and it seemed like a bit of a, a word jumble that I was trying to get through, but I'm trying to express a lot of ideas that are in this trailer yeah. that just don't really jive with the previous uh, editions of this 
film franchise. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of this at all. This is this is a big hot mess. This trailer looks, in my opinion, here. Um, you know, I would, I've never been a fan of this King Arthur and the Nazi era with Transformers. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I think with Transformers, it's kind of simple. You either there's two movies you can either pitch here, right? You can either do the animated show way back Beast Wars, yeah, and take it back to the dinosaurs age, and they've been around since then, which would kind of be cool to see these, you know, these these Transformers transform into animals. Or you just give us a movie that we've all been wanting and just go to Cybertron. Yeah. Because this whole Earth stuff is just not doing it for me. Um, uh, Mark Wahlberg in there just looked out of place. Yeah, so he's returning from the, from the, the last, last one, one right? right? Yeah, so he looked out of place. There was one cool shot that I really liked, which was Optimus kind of floating off there. Yeah. In space. With the debris and all that yeah. stuff. I thought that was kind of cool. You know, I know Michael Bay. I give it to him every time. He does action well. Like, there's some really cool action shots, and it sounded great, and they look great. But I just don't care anymore for the, <laughs> these movies. They just... They're just not doing it for me. Yeah, the returning yeah. Mark Wahlberg kind of threw me off. I knew he was in this movie, but yeah. when you see how this movie is being presented as this post-apocalyptic feel, he was kind of like this crazy inventor, right? And now that we're inserting him into what appears to be some sort of final stand of humanity against the Decepticons, and then you have the returning Josh Dumel, who was in Transformers 1 through 3, I believe. Yeah, the military was, guy. Yeah, yeah, and you see them interacting a bit, which yeah. kind of threw me off. It's right. Like they're blending these two separate or seemingly separate-ish universes together. And you have Mark Wahlberg, who's this kind of crazy dad inventor, who's encouraging a military man, a guy that's been fighting the Decepticons since... You know, since they first, well, first apparently landed on Earth in Transformers 1, yeah. which I'm a fan of, by the yeah. way. Yeah, that's a good one. It just, that I, that contrast I didn't like. I didn't like those two characters together. I'm a fan of Mark Wahlberg, and he did fine. He kind of overacted, I felt, in the last one. And in this trailer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But seeing him here, and he seems to be a part of this I don't know this resistance, or I really don't know what's happening here on Earth. Like, what's yeah. changed since Age of Extinction when the Dinobots rode off into the sunset? There, like, I, I really don't know what's going on here. It's it's just again, it's it's just a lot of visuals to try to draw you in that way, and that's what Transformers movies are. They make billions of dollars, mind you, mm -hmm. but it's just using that again. There's not a lot, and I always say I don't want a lot of the story, but for this type of movie, I need to understand what's going on when you're showing me. Nazi flags. You, you have a title like the last night. Uh, dragons. You, dragons. Yeah. You, it seems to be that that Unicron is the main villain here, which is cool. But again, put us on Cybertron if you're going to yeah. go that route, right? Exactly. Yeah. So. It's one of the things that I guess we as North American moviegoers have to realize is that not every single movie that comes out in North America is going to be made for us. Yeah. True. That's so true. I don't know if you guys knew the box office numbers from the font, from the previous huge. Over huge, a billion. huge numbers in China. Yeah. yeah, and chances are this is partially being funded by Chinese money, just like the previous Transformers. So it makes sense why there's a sequel. It's money in the bank for yeah. Universal. Oh yeah, I'm not blaming them for trying to make no, money. No, it's 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 fine. It's well, I, I, yeah. yeah. So I, I I get why, but the thing that I'm trying to figure out and what Troy was saying is why not just give us the fully CG movie on Cybertron? Give us what eventually people are going to want to watch yeah. because this like basically shoehorning humans into a world with gigantic robots they're <laughs> fret why yeah they're, they have no business in this fight yeah like they're they trying to humanize it a bit like do you need someone to connect to on screen i is guess that, is that a question i guess like, it, is that what they're trying to get at? i guess maybe to make it relatable yeah and maybe like i don't know I don't know. I'm not Michael Bay. He shoots action amazingly. I would rather him not make Transformers and make Bad Boys 3, honestly. Well, yeah. And I think, you know, with a lot of these movies, you've got to give some new blood in there. You can, you know, you have directors on there for maybe one or two, three films. I mean, look at Sam Raimi, right? He yeah. overstayed his welcome. Josh Whedon almost was fatigued. I think he needs to go away. Exactly. Get some new with blood in there. 13 Hours? Yeah. Like, that's a great... Like, I, it's not a, f like, thrilling or, like, super... It's a good movie. Fantastic. Yeah. Like, it's not, like, the top end of, you know, when you're looking at Hurt Locker or anything like yeah. that. Yeah. But I really enjoyed mm -hmm. 13 Hours. You know, I thought the action was great. The actors were great in it. And it was a smaller Michael Bay film. When you yeah. go back and look at Pain and Gain, too. Yeah. He did as well. And I really enjoyed that. Like, that's just kind of an off-color movie that mm -hmm. is different. And you kind of contrasting that style of Michael Bay. And that's what I think the Bad Boys films are. It's yeah. a nice meld of those type of movies, Pain and Gain, Pain and Gain. 
13 hours with this type of Transformers massive explosion type things, right? Yeah. And I think that works for him. I agree. He's fatigued here. Yeah. He needs to move on. They need to hand this franchise onto someone different to do something different. They're exactly. kind of chewing up a lot of the Transformers lore in these movies mm-hmm. without giving it to someone else to try to do something different. For sure. Did, did you guys think it took itself too seriously too, this trailer? Or was it yes. just me? I mean, the tone, I guess, the, the, yeah. the music. Yeah, that, it's the music yeah. and the, the vibe of this post-apocalyptic yeah. world at war type thing that they're trying to get out here. And yeah, I just don't. And then you also see Optimus attacking Bumblebee. That was yeah. the other big revelation in this trailer. And mm-hmm. it looks like Optimus is either under some sort of mind control would be my guess. Yeah. And that's why he's fighting Bumblebee. I'm not sure of the force that's left on Earth to fight with the humans. Right. And, how they're going to defeat a unicron that's chewing up the the moon in this first yeah. image. So I don't know what they're going to do here with this franchise. And well, it's actually, it's pretty clear what they're going to do with this franchise. They're going to continue to pump up movies. I think we'll eventually get that Cybertron movie, yeah. but I think we're going to have to wait for it. And it's another one of these movies. It's going to make a billion dollars. We're going to see more of these. This doesn't put my, my ass in the seat no. for this movie. I'm not going to support a movie that doesn't have any, depth to it really right, yeah. but i will eventually watch it. it's going to be a netflix for me though i think for sure exactly um one one thing that just occurred to me is like there was this whole thing a couple years ago about like it's a gritty reboot and this is what we've been getting with transformers they've been ever getting ever so grittier and grittier and we literally have a post-apocalyptic the hero of the series is now a bad guy attacking his friends like what else what else are you gonna give us no you can only you can only do so much with this franchise yeah, I think. yeah. Yeah, they're going to sell a lot of toys. They are indeed. <laughs> so, let's get into the trailer that me personally, I've been most anticipating talking about here. I'm a Definitely. big fan of Guardians of the Galaxy, big fan of the original series, and the movie that came out a couple of years ago. The first thing that we'll all note here, and, and coming off the back end of the first teaser trailer, was the music, right? This was something that we discussed with Sanjay as far as they didn't use a different song in that first teaser trailer. Now they've gone and used something completely different here again. This is Sweets, Fox on the Run. What did you guys think, first of all, of the music? Because this is such a huge element of this movie and of the previous movie. Did you like the choice of song to go with this trailer once we get into the kind of the guts of the trailer here? Yes, I definitely appreciate it. You know, they must have listened to the audience. I think a lot of people's concern was why they go back with the same song. So yeah. I'm really glad they switched it up. And it just, it totally has that feel, man. Um, very 80s like. Yes. I love the colors that's going on. You know, the Marvel Studios logo when it appears. I really like how that looks. So um, it's great stuff. Yeah, and we see this giant monster that we did have that promo image for. And we had discussed and thought that this was probably going to be a monster they're fighting at the very start of the film. They appear to have some sort of reputation that's built post Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1 with the defeat of Ronin. And it looks like they're out fighting for the galaxy again, this this monster of sorts. And I, it, it, I think this is going to be almost their opening action sequence. You're going to see them... You know, either hired to defeat this monster or something to that effect. Yeah. And it looks like Drax eventually gets swallowed up by it. Yeah. He's inside stabbing it there. And I didn't notice this in the first trailer, but that leap that Gamora makes is up onto this thing's leg or whatever. So it looks like it's going to be fun opening sequence, reintroducing us to the characters. And that's what this trailer was really about, right? It was just, you know, here's baby Groot. Who's going to sell all of the oh toys. Oh my goodness, is he ever and you know just bring you right back into that universe. Yeah, right? and we get, you know, good good idea of Peter Quill and yeah. Drax here and their interaction and Gamora and a nice scene with Rocket and Groot here and seeing their interaction again building on that idea. You know, you could really sense that they're going to maybe spin these guys off into their own movie the same way they did a comic book, right? That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. And what what do you think of Baby Groot here and how he's you know, very, very different from what we got yeah. in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1, but just as endearing as this, you know, it seems like he's lost his maturity, but still has his, um, maybe his memories in that. I don't know. It's hard to say. He seems to have that, that kind of play with Rocket still, right? The same vocabulary, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I like I, I like what they've done with Baby Groot. I, I, was, I was pretty certain that they were going to go this route and plug Baby Groot as much as possible, be, you know, sell a lot of toys, like you've mentioned. Um, I like how he's handled. I, I, it's going to be an interesting dynamic between Rocket now and Baby Groot, where Rocket's going to be after looking, is going to have to look over Groot now, right? So yeah, it's it's it's, it's great stuff, and it's a, it's a cool scene here we got with uh, the bomb going off, and yeah. and then Baby Groot runs off and, and really pronounces "I am Groot." Yeah, you know, I really like that. It's good stuff. 
Yeah, it's cool. And there seems to be some large space battle going on in the background here. We do get some images of the Milano flying through these these kind of pod like space shuttles or spaceships or what have you. Yeah. And I think it's going to be really fun to see some of that dynamic building in space, kind of very Star Wars esque. Yeah. Right? But just on a bit lighter scale here. We do see some images here of the Ravengers and what appears to be, at least from the first trailer, that prison break type scene where you do have the Ravengers and they're breaking Yondu out. But that's one thing we didn't really get in this trailer was the other characters like a Yondu, like a Nebula, or even Kurt Russell's character, Eagle the Living Planet. So it was just really focused in on our main cast of characters until we get to the last scene here. Uh, Did you think the absence of some of these characters hurts this trailer at all? I didn't think it. I didn't think it hurt. Predominantly the ego, the living planet, Kurt Rusker. I didn't think it hurt the trailer because I think they want to hold that off to be that trailer that we get closer to release. Maybe spring next year, we'll probably get the trailer where they break down his character a bit more. Um, one thing I noticed in the trailer is that they don't really show much of Gamora. No. She does, she's got that one speaking part at the, towards the end, but then that's it. It's mainly focused on Groot and Rocket and Drax and Peter Quill and Star Lord, and I'm like wondering, was that on purpose? Is that maybe they're saving something for her later on? And uh, the whole Ravagers thing, I guess, I think would I think that's probably a, a, another trailer they're going to focus on the side characters because yeah. you know you don't want a bit you don't want a trailer that's too busy. All these things that you got to keep track of, like they focus on Baby Groot, which everybody's going to love. I mean, everybody's going to buy the toys. Yeah, I think they I think this trailer did what it wanted to do. It created hype. Yes. Everybody loved Rocket. Everybody loved Groot. Go with that. Add some funny Drax moments in, and everybody's talking about it. Yeah, that's what's going to draw people in. I think the absence of Gamora isn't going to speak into her lack of presence in the film, but more the fact that she didn't have any of those moments in the in the original. She had that one Drax line that seemed like it was stolen from the script, right? Mm-hmm. That when she was talking about, you know, stick up their asses or whatever, mm-hmm. uh, that was a very Drax line. She wasn't really a breakout character. She looks cool, and she's, she's not as badass as she is in the comics. Like, she doesn't have that same kind of, you know, almost deviant fighting style to her, almost possessive. Mm-hmm. But... I just feel like she's not one of those breakout characters. They really focused in on Groot, Rocket, and Drax here. Even less so Peter Quill. Like He's there. He's yeah. got some good lines. But at the same time, it's, it's really focusing in on those three characters that were the breakout characters from Volume 1. And that's just it. Exactly. Yeah, they really put the light on the breakout characters to get you back in there. So I, I got a real feel from this this trailer, though, that a lot of this is probably from early on in the movie. Because, again, this is what Marvel is doing really well with their trailers. I have no idea what this movie is about other than the fact that it looks like a good time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a way to cut a trailer. Like, you, you're showing me some of the good footage, some of the stuff to bring me into the theater. I'm excited. I'm hyped about this movie. But I couldn't tell you what this movie is about, who the main villain is. Is it Ego the Living Planet? Is it someone else? Is it going to revolve around an Infinity Stone? Maybe, maybe not. But I'm happy that I'm this excited for a film and I have no idea what it's about. That's that's a way to cut a trailer. No, I completely agree. Yeah, definitely. Towards the end, or right at the end of this trailer, we get our first look at Mantis and our first dialogue from her. The first thing that sticks out to me is she's not green. <laughs> She is green in the comics, and so I think that's probably the right way they went with yeah. this. You know, Too much green. A, having another green character. <laughs> and what did you think of her interaction with Peter Quill and the Dra- and the Drax scene there, right? Oh, I think this was brilliant. This was uh, the highlight for me in this whole trailer because uh, coming out of Guardians of the Galaxy 1, uh, Drax was my, was my star. I, I really like what he did because for his acting range isn't the biggest, and I think uh, James Gunn, no, he's a, he's a character's director, right? He knows how to play these guys so well, and he really just enhanced the experience with Drax going into this movie. So I like that he gets his little moment here, and and with uh, with uh, Magda, is it sorry? Mantis. Mantis, sorry. Yes, yeah, so with Mantis is, is just is a great scene. It's funny. It's the funniest scene in my opinion throughout the whole trailer. Yeah. Yeah, it really accentuates who Drax is, and and really gives you that idea that we're going to get a lot of that dry humor from Drax in this. And I really mm-hmm. like that that they're leveraging on that. They're they're playing to the strengths of these characters. Well, it seems like they're also evolving the characters themselves, particularly with Groot. Right? Yeah. Who knew that they're going to contrast and do something completely different than this fan favorite? But they're introducing this, you know, this little baby Groot in this little Ravengers outfit, yeah. or this little Guardians outfit. Like, it, my. I Show it to my wife. It's like you have to watch it. She was a huge fan of Groot 
and Rocket in Volume 1, and she absolutely adores Baby Groot. That's this awesome. Is gonna, oh, this is going to do huge money. Like, I'm going to have Baby Groot everything. <laughs> <laughs> do you think they'll age up Baby Groot by the end of this film? Or I think they will. Yeah? I think they will maybe. Maybe toward, like, towards the end of the first movie, Groot has to make the sacrifice to save everybody. I think maybe he may have to make a similar sacrifice where he's forced to grow up into a more mature version of himself. Oh, okay. Just a, just for as far as character development, because if you have a baby Groot, you kind of might fall into the one trick pony thing if that's him for the two hours of the movie. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. And I think James Gunn is far smarter to to do that, right? Not to leave his character in one particular thing. It's got to make everybody evolve and make the character grow. Yeah. Figuratively yeah. this time, I guess. Yeah, I'd like to see that. Absolutely. Yeah. By the sounds of it, we all love this trailer. I think this is going to be an absolutely fantastic movie. I'm going to cut my trailer watching here. Okay. You know, I may eat my words a little <laughs> later. I may want to see what they're going to do with Eagle of the Living Planet. Yeah. Particularly Kurt Russell's character. I still think it's going to be some sort of sentient representation of a, like, I don't know, some sort of avatar or something like yeah. that for a planet that's actually living, breathing. And I think that's probably the planet it looks like they crash on. But it's yet to be seen here. But... Uh, I'm really excited for this film, and I just cannot wait. May 5th or May whatever can't come soon enough to nice. see some more Guardians here. So did you like this more than Transformers? or? <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course, man. As, as far as Marvel trailers are concerned, this is probably one of the better ones we've seen. I'm, I'm in the same boat as you, Tim. Yeah. No more trailer watching for me. Yeah, I don't yeah. want to get ruined. I, I purposely didn't watch the, the most recent Rogue One trailer. Wow. I don't know how you guys do it. That's great. I yeah. just don't click yeah. on it. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I can kind of get into a mode where I watch these movies. And I, I just I turn off my spoiler mode, like whatever I've seen. I can kind of just let it go out the window. But I, I, I got to see more of this. I, I just I'm just too into these these movies. And yeah, Marvel's been doing a great yeah. job with all these trailers, right? But you you have to watch it because you want to see it, not because you need enticing into the film. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that about wraps it up for trailers this week. I'm, I'm excited to discuss a Spider-Man trailer when it eventually comes out, but that's likely going to have to wait because next week we get Rogue One. Huge, and we'll be done Catalyst by then. Wayne, have yes. you been reading Catalyst? No, no, I haven't. Uh, you got to get into it, man. That. So we're going to be discussing Catalyst and doing a lot of speculating. Coming into Rogue One, a spoiler-free speculating as well because as you guys know I, I i don't watch a lot of trailers we did last week cover the finer international trailer for rogue one that was kind of our our special 50th episode type review there but we're going to be going through in a bit more detail and reviewing catalyst and discussing a bit what our expectations are going into this movie and maybe trying to make a few predictions of some surprise cameos that we may or may not see from our original trilogy characters so the following week, we'll be doing a full Rogue One review as well with the arrest of the internet, but <laughs> we're very passionate Star Wars fans, and we love you guys tuning in to hear our thoughts on Rogue One. So be sure to check us out next week for your prelude to Rogue One and the following week for the review of Rogue One itself. I'm so excited for this film. I got people at work talking to me about it. Oh, yeah. That again, coming back to an experience with Episode Seven, people that... I had no idea I even knew what Star Wars were. Wow. Yeah. What Star Wars was. <laughs> are coming and saying, are you going to Star Wars? Are you going to see Star I'm like, yeah. And they're like, oh, okay. And I was explaining to people today about the placement of Rogue One relative mm-hmm. to the original trilogy, relative to Episode Seven, mm-hmm. And I just, everyone, it's, the hype is building. When I hear people in my office talking about Star Wars, yeah. I know that the hype is at a fever pitch because it is, it's reaching the population that don't necessarily make an effort to go out to movies on a regular basis, but they're making an exception to go see Rogue One in its opening weekend and the second weekend, whatever. Yeah. Right? It's 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 real. Do you think they've done a great job now at this point establishing that this movie does take place before episode four? Like the general audience knows Vader's there, they're you know I still think there's gonna be confusion. Yeah. People yeah. are gonna be like, Where's Ray? Where's Finn? Right. You know, what's going on here? Why is Kylo Ren look like Darth Vader again? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what happened to his lightsaber? I thought it was yeah. weird. Yeah. It looked weird before and now it's fixed. Like yeah. I think that's something that's going to have to come after. People are going to come out of the movie maybe a bit confused, mm-hmm. but hopefully there's enough people around that can say, no, look, this happens before this. They're chasing the Death Star plans. It leads into A New Hope. So yeah. the people I explained today kind of understood it. Like awesome. when I said they're chasing the Death Star plans, mm-hmm. okay, that makes sense at where this placement is. It's it's not, well, it could also be 
after Empire Strikes Back too, but <laughs> yeah, because there's no opening crawl now too, right? So yeah, when they so. go in there, they're not going to be able to know that this is after Episode Three and yada yada. yada so yeah, hopefully they make it clear. I don't know how they do that without putting text on the screen. This is before Episode Four. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know, Wayne. It's been an absolute pleasure having you back on the show, and we really look forward to having you back again to discuss all things nerd. Where can people find you on the internet? Um, the best way to find me is audio at Audio Rebellion on Twitter. It's really my only online presence right now. <laughs> but thank you very much for having me back again. It's been a, it's been a good conversation. Yeah, anytime, man. We're, we're always looking forward to having new people come in to the nerd room to discuss different aspects of the nerd world, whether it's trailers, Star Wars, Guardians, whatever. We look forward to having you back on the show sometime soon. If you'd like to get a hold of us, you can always grab us on Twitter. Our handles are at the end of the episode. You can always grab us at hashtag enter the nerd room. If you'd like to be a part of the conversation, throw some of your thoughts, some of your theories about these trailers, about some of the other things we discussed. What do you think is going to happen in Thor 3 with Hulk? Anything to that effect, you can always grab us on our Facebook page, YouTube page. You can comment down below. Just search the Nerd Room Podcast on YouTube. You can find these podcasts there. And be sure to always tune in every single Monday to our other podcast, which is on the same feed you're listening to right now, where we discuss and recap each new episode of Star Wars Rebels. The momentum is picking up there. Huge episode last week, and a huge episode coming down the pipe this week, I believe. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been a hell of a show, a hell of a series, and I can't wait to see what happens next leading into Rogue One. Yep, so we've got a lot of Star Wars talk coming down the pipe here. On the Nerd Room feed, be sure to tune back for all your Star Wars news. All right, guys, until next week for the Nerd Room, I'm Tim. I'm Troy. I'm Wayne. And thank you for entering the Nerd Room. Don't forget to subscribe and rate and review us on iTunes. You can find our hosts, Tim, Sunday, and Troy on Twitter at TheNerdRM1912Podcasting and Troy, the boy 87